Good afternoon. This being a celebration of Head Start, and because I know that all of you are in a celebratory and joyous mood, I'm going to say good afternoon again. I want you to say it like you're celebrating 50 years of extraordinary success. Good afternoon. Now I know I'm in the right place. To this extraordinary gathering of parents and staff and Americans of every hue and heritage, every ethnicity and every generation, I simply say thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this extraordinary celebration. To Yasmina Vinci, the executive director of Head Start, who is responsible for me having this opportunity to be here 15 years almost exactly from the time I first addressed this Head Start conference uh, years ago. To Congressman DeLauro, who is en route to this festive occasion to Dr. Ziegler, the father of Head Start, and to those Head Start babies of whatever age you are, and to the staff and faculty and to the leadership of the Head Start Association, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this extraordinary occasion. Now, I have to share with you I've not always been so fortunate to be a part of such an extraordinary gathering, such an august gathering. In fact, in my 20 years as a civil rights lawyer and, and as a minister, I've had occasion uh, from time to time to speak to people. And I've not always been so fortunate to be in the midst of such an august group of people. In fact, I can think of a time many years ago when as a young, naive, innocent minister, I found myself in a big city, standing outside of this beautiful Gothic cathedral early on a Sunday morning. True story. I found myself outside of this beautiful Gothic cathedral on a Sunday morning, supposing that there were about 2,000 or so people inside waiting to hear this naive, presumptuous preacher preach. True story. I made my way into this beautiful Gothic cathedral, and I immediately noticed the obvious, the pastor and exactly two members. True story. <laughs> but I did what I was taught to do, which is to say that you preach, you speak, you share with two people in the same way that you would to 5,000, with sincerity, with conviction from the heart. So I made my way into, into the pulpit and I began to preach and I immediately noticed the obvious. Of these two members, one of whom I'll call Ms. Jones, the other I will simply call Ms. Smith, I noticed that Ms. Jones immediately fell asleep. <laughs> but as I was preaching, as I was speaking from the depths of my heart, I immediately noticed the obvious that Ms. Smith seemed to hang on to every word I had to say. She said hallelujah at all the right moments. She said amen, amen at all the right times. She tapped her toes, she clapped her hands, she nodded her head, and I thought to myself on this Sunday morning, at least I'm reaching one somebody. So I made my way out of the pulpit to the side of the pastor, and the pastor said to me, uh, Brother Brooks, you know I'm just so sorry. Uh, Miss Jones, she falls asleep on everybody, and Miss Smith, She's out of her mind and did not understand the thing you had to say. So you can see why I am so extraordinarily happy <laughs> to be in the midst of so many people who are wide awake and presumably in your right mind. On this afternoon, were you to gather into your arms 
the legacy, the rich inheritance, those whom we call our children. Were you to hold in your arms, in loving embrace, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old child? Were you to hold them close enough to your heart that they might hear your heartbeat and hear the love that you have for them? Were you to hold them that close? They might pose to you this question, or rather these questions. Why is today special, and why are we here? Why is today special? Why are we here? Why are we here as parents? Why are we here as staff? Why are we here as faculty? Why are we here as citizens of this great republic, of every hue and every heritage, of every generation? Why are we here at this extraordinary moment in history? Fifty years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, 50 years after the Selma to Montgomery march, 50 years after Bloody Sunday, and 50 years after the launch of one of America's greatest experiments in democracy and education, otherwise and eloquently known as Head Start. Were you to hold your child, your granddaughter, your grandson, your son or your daughter close to your heart, they might ask you, mommy, daddy, grandmommy, granddaddy, why are we here? Why is today special? You might answer that simple series of interrogatives, that simple series of queries. We're here because we're in the midst of a birthday celebration, a birthday celebration of Head Start. Every child, every son, every daughter, every mother, every father, every grandmother, every grandfather that dedicated herself to our children's legacy in this great enterprise called Head Start. A first lady of this republic known as Eleanor Roosevelt. Nearly 50 years before the founding of Head Start, she stood before an august gathering not unlike this one, and she said these words, this, or rather these, are no ordinary times. This is no ordinary time. We find ourselves at this moment in our history, uncomfortably situated between the past and the present. We find ourselves in the midst of a republic that is a, of a divided and ambivalent mind when it comes to education. But those who are gathered in this room at this extraordinary moment in history understand that we have made, we have committed ourselves, we have dedicated ourselves to education of the first order and education of excellence for our children. We have dedicated ourselves to this Head Start organization and association because we believe in our children. It's no ordinary time when we are able to send a child off to an academy called Head Start to prepare for reading, to prepare for math, knowing that that child will come home at the end of the day a little better prepared to become a citizen a little better prepared to become a mathematician, a little better prepared to become an attorney, a little better prepared to become a physician, a little better prepared to become a nurse, a little better prepared to become a police officer, even a little better prepared to become the president and CEO of the NAACP.
It's no ordinary time. When we commit ourselves to prepare our children for the very, for the very best that this country has to offer, it's no ordinary time when we dedicate ourselves to the proposition that every child matters. Black children matter, brown children matter, Latino children matter, Asian children matter, Jewish children matter, Protestant and Catholic children matter, all of our children matter. When we dedicate ourselves to the proposition that every child matters, we underscore the proposition that America matters and that if our children matter, we can make this country matter. And if we can make our country matter, we can make it better. A story is told of a Baptist preacher in the state of Mississippi by the name of the Reverend James Daniel Broom. In the height of the Civil Rights Movement, in the heat of battle, agents of the state government created a file on him, surveilled him, followed him, as was the custom in those days in the 1960s in the state of Mississippi. They surveilled Medgar Evers and Charles Evers. They surveilled Fannie Lou Hamer. They surveilled anyone who stood up for freedom and justice under our American Constitution. The Reverend James Daniel Broom was followed and tracked by what was known and then called the Sovereignty Commission. Many years later, his son-in-law, your speaker, did a little research to find out what was in his file such that in the height of the American Civil Rights Movement, in the midst of an ugly epic of racialized brutality in this country, what was in his file such that the state would deem him necessary, dangerous, and subversive enough to follow? Two entries. One, referring to his activities to found the Head Start program in his county in Mississippi. The other entry, his membership in the NAACP. My brothers and sisters, let us be clear. There's a relationship between Head Start and the NAACP. Because when we stand for education, when we stand for educational excellence, when we stand for our children having the very best that this republic has to offer, we're standing for civil rights, we're standing for justice, we're standing up for righteousness, we're standing for the very best that this country has and the very best it has for our children. My father-in-law risked his life for the NAACP, but he also risked his life for Head Start. Martin Luther, once, Martin Luther King once said, if a man has not found anything for which he is willing to die, he is not fit to live. I'm not sure about you, but I'm not worried about dying. I'm very much worried about living. And those of you who are dedicated and committed to Head Start can say to yourselves and say to this country, we will live for our children. We will live for our sons and daughters. We will live for our grandchildren. We will live for a better way of life. We will live for education. We will live for academic excellence. We will live that our children might have the very best that this country has to offer. 
That's who we are. That's what we stand for. And those are our values. When I was a little boy, my grandmother, Mrs. Rosalie Prela, was fond of telling me a little story that reminds us of why we're here this afternoon. She said to me, Cornell, when you came into this world, you did not make a great first impression. <laughs> she said you weighed three pounds and three ounces. My friends tell me I've not managed to gain much weight since then. <laughs> My grandmother said that when you were born, because you were so premature and so small, that the, physici the physicians rushed to the side of your mother and told her, your son will not live beyond the end of the day. So if you are religious, you should have a chaplain come and bless and pray for your child, your son. My grandmother, who was a staunch Methodist, swears by this story. They looked high and low for a priest and couldn't find one. Looked high and low for a Protestant minister and couldn't find one. But they did find a good rabbi. And my grandmother swears because of the prayers of that rabbi and because of her prayers, I'm here today. She told me that story because she wanted me to understand that life is a gift to be given to others in service. That's what Head Start is about. It is a gift to the next generation. It is a gift to our children. It is a gift that we have to protect, that we have to hold sacred, that we have to guard, that we have to stand behind, and that we have to wrap our arms around in loving embrace. That's what Head Start is about. So every moment that you give in sacrifice, every moment that you give in volunteering, every moment that you give in service, you're not giving to this program. You're not giving to this government program this government legacy you're giving to your children and you're giving to your future that's what head start is about when my mother was a young woman living not too far from here in Anacostia in southeast Washington DC she heard about a wonderful new program. She didn't know a whole lot about it, but she did know that our family believed deeply in education. And so she signed me up for Head Start. As an indication of what this start meant for me, were you to go to the national headquarters in Baltimore, Maryland, of the NAACP. When you walk into the building, you'll notice a large bust of Medgar Evers, a martyr in the freedom struggle in this country. If you go to the second floor, you'll see pictures of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and Roy Wilkins. If you walk into my office, you look on the wall and you'll see a picture of William Edward Burgat Du Bois. And if you happen to look past the trinkets and, and memorabilia on the walls, you'll notice at the top of the wall is my diploma from Yale Law School. Beneath that, you'll see a diploma from Boston University School of Theology. Beneath that, you'll find a diploma from Jackson State University. But beneath that and at our level is a diploma, a certificate from Head Start. Of those, I'm most proud of the one that says, not Yale, not Boston University, not Jackson State, but Head Start. Because I'm proud of the work that you've done, the work that you do, and the work that you yet shall do for all of us, for every child anywhere in America who yet believes 
that we represent the future. We represent the hope of this country. Head Start is at the core of the work of the NAACP. Over 50 years ago, a brave band of civil rights pioneers led by Thurgood Marshall took on an odious doctrine known as separate but equal. In a case called Brown, called Brown v. Board of Education, they took on this legal doctrine of separate but equal, enshrined in a court decision known as Plessy versus Ferguson. Not merely because it was a violation of the Constitution, but because they understood and the NAACP understands that education is not only a testament of who you are and how smart you are, it is a testament to your character. It is a testament to your parents' values. It's a testament to our nature and to the nature and the character of our country. And so when you ask what is the mission of the NAACP, I would suggest to you it is the same mission of Head Start, to raise up a generation of citizens, to raise up a generation of children, to raise up a generation of Americans that represent the best values of this country. That's what we share in common. That's the legacy we have between us. And so my brothers and sisters, particularly those of you who are parents, let me suggest to you that you are engaged in the same dangerous line of work is the NAACP. You see, when you stand up for justice and stand against injustice, there are those who rise up in violent opposition. Let me remind you, when you stand up for your children because you believe in their beauty and brilliance, there are those who will rise in opposition. When you stand behind your children and you say, we will not allow them to succumb to the preschool to prison pipeline, they are those who will rise in opposition. When you stand behind your children and say, we will not give them over to the prison industrial complex, they are those who rise in opposition. I want to say to those of you in this National Head Start Association that when there are people in this country who are silent, with respect to the care and protection of our children, when there are those who are silent in their cynicism and pessimism about what we can do, what we can achieve, and how far we can go, I say to you, quote this hymn of the NAACP to them. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as a rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on, let us march on, let us march on, let us march on till victory is won for all of us, for the NAACP, for Head Start, for all of our children, and for this nation.